Hey everyone, it's Rushni of Glamazzini.com bringing you light and laughter. Party as you all, welcome to Find Your Light Live. Okay, today we are getting right into it because we have a lot to cover. We are going to be talking about the Oscars, Black women, Slapgate, and how it has affected us. I have with me two of my friends, Keisha Monk and Tanya Rogers. Okay, and so I'm getting in quickly because... Um, we have so many things to cover. I'm sad already that we're not going to be able to cover them all. All right. If you have been under a rock, let me give you the TLDR. This week on Sunday evening was the um, Academy Awards. And those Academy Awards uh, were, were exclamated by Will Smith walking up on the stage and basically busting Chris Rock a hard slap in his face for a joke that was said about his wife. I have... Um, been on the internet this past week, you guys, and I have been having some interesting conversations. Two people that shared very interesting points that I wanted to amplify on my Facebook page. And here are Keisha and Tanya. Okay, Tanya is a lover of God and, a, and people who is deeply committed to racial reconciliation. Mm, why can't I speak? And justice, as well as wholeness and sustainable living. Her interests include urban homesteading and natural hair care. Tanya lives in Austin, Texas with her husband and two children. Yeah, Tanya. Hello. Keisha Mong is a three-time cancer survivor and HBCU graduate. Um, she has been wowing people with her voice for over 25 years. She has recorded projects for hundreds of global brands, including McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and DreamWorks. She is currently the live announcer for the BET Soul Train Awards and recently made history as the first African-American woman live announcer at the Tony Awards. Hi, Keisha. Hello, darling. <laughs> Hi. Okay, let's get right into it. This week, I woke up on Monday I saw the slap, I thought it was staged, okay? <clears throat> I went to my Facebook page, which is where I've been having most of this conversation. If you are watching it live, we're on YouTube right now. If you're watching the replay, it will be uploaded to Facebook there as well. We had a conversation back and forth. And during the week, I realized a few things. The first thing I realized is I didn't know anything else that was happening at the Oscars besides the slap. So one of the things that I was intentionally doing was researching information about what happened at the Oscars beyond this, this incident, right? Because from my knowledge, it was supposed to be, um, I knew that there was a black producer and I wanted more information, right? Um, the second thing that happened is within that conversation, I started to notice that in-house, meaning with Black women, we were having a lot of different experiences. Okay, before we go any further, I want to touch on why this conversation includes race. Because there have been some people uh, who have come to my page and basically said that race is not part of the conversation. I have seen white and Black people say this to me for different reasons though, for different reasons. And so Tanya um, had posted something on her page that she so graciously allowed me to repost. And I wanted you, Tanya, to start off by giving um, some insight as to why this conversation includes race. Sure, and thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm really excited about this, Arsene. So this conversation includes race because when we start to talk about the things that happened between Will Smith and Chris Rock, we see two black men and a black woman and the black woman being mocked by a black man and then her black husband responding. And while that might seem like just a joke was made, a husband got upset and he responded violently, the race of the people involved um, comes into play because there's a whole conversation around black women 
And if you're not black, you might miss this, but there's a whole conversation about black women and the, the burden that we bear, at least in American society, of being the strong one, having to take care of everything ourselves, not having a support system, people relying on us for everything, whether that's in the home, in the workplace, wherever, and that we're not supported or taken care of. This is an in-community conversation, and so it may not be known to people outside of the Black community. But then you have a joke being made by a Black man about a Black woman and about her hair. And while hair might seem like a frivolous thing, it is actually an issue that has a long history for Black women in America. When we were enslaved, um, our hair was a part of that. We were, we were mocked. We were treated poorly because of our hair. We were, in some cases, our hair was either removed or it was hidden. So there's a lot about Black women's hair that is very deeply rooted and deeply connected. And it's a part of our expression of self oftentimes. So the fact that a Black man made a joke about a Black woman's hair, and then the Black woman was um, defended by her husband, that piece of the conversation can't be uh, overemphasized, maybe underemphasized. I'm not sure the term I want to use, but that's a very important piece of the conversation. So while we talk about all of the things on the surface, for Black people, those pieces all matter because they play into offense, history, pain, and for us, the conversation, sometimes the fact that we need protecting outweighs the violence of the act. I'm not saying that's my opinion, but for some people that was a piece of it. So I personally asked my friends who are not black to just kind of have their feelings, have their opinions, but just step back and choose not to engage right now. Just kind of look and listen and actually hear how this was hitting black people because sometimes without meaning to their words were actually pretty harmful. Um, and adding to the pain that Black people kind of tend to experience as microaggressions in America pretty consistently. Right. Thanks, Tanya. There's, yeah. yeah, there's a part of this conversation you cannot understand is basically the gist. And so it's an opportunity to listen and now we'll move on. Um, the other thing I want to say to everybody watching this is clearly we're not going to be able to cover everything. There's only an hour. That's understood. The other thing is, if you have participated in any conversation about this topic all week, you know good and full well, you might get triggered. Okay, we're not going to please everybody. We're not even going to probably always agree with each other. Okay, that's the ground rules. Now, let's move on to this, which is something I wanted to highlight. Keisha is here because one, she's my friend and I love her, but two... <laughs> 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 but two, she commented on one of my posts. So during the week, I was digging through Google. I'm Googling, trying to figure out what else happened at this award show. I cannot find it. And as I'm posting up articles where, I, you know, the article actually highlights, okay, Will Packer is the producer. And um, there was an all black you know, team and on all these things, I'm, I'm amplifying them on my pages. And Keisha, who is, um, did y'all hear her bio? No? Did y'all hear the first African American woman live announcer at the Tony Award? <laughs> I listen, but okay, Keisha, I got to come out. I come back in. I messaged her this morning. I was like, girl, why did I read your bio and do like a whole twerk out? I was like, <laughs> that's my friend. So hey. oh, I was like, yes, Keisha. Anyway, Keisha came in a working, okay, SAG asked a working talent in the industry who has behind the scenes um, experience for how, what it's like to be this. And she posted her heart in my comment section. And her heart, if you go ahead and talk about it, can you talk about what you posted? Well, of course, my perspective is a little different, not too much different than your average Joe, but being that I'm very, very well in tune to the industry, music, because I also play six instruments and, you know, I, I love, you know, I'm like a tech geek. So I love the, the, you know, the Hollywood magic of graphics and art and makeup and all this stuff, right? Um, but it hasn't been easy. You know, you asked for my short bio. I'll yeah. do a little bit of what I do. But mm -hmm. and, and again, you got to keep in mind that social media is merely a snapshot of, of the way people think and the way we move and navigate throughout these streets. I tend to 
like everybody else, share my wins. But my entire career has been just filled with adversity. As a matter of fact, check this out. I think as I take a step back, I think that I must have at some point subconsciously decided to embrace a career where I wouldn't have to be seen. Mm -hmm. I did 25 years in radio. And mm -hmm. instead of being this spunky on camera type of person, because I'm an insane creative, I think at some point being teased as a dark skinned child, having big lips, having nappy hair, nappy, and I use that in quotes, one day I just kind of felt comfort in a studio with one microphone with a door that I could close where people wouldn't necessarily judge me of how I looked, but to kind of get to know me through the power of the microphone. You know, and this, I got into radio a long time ago, like years and years ago, but I'm thinking, you know, I'm having a reality check. Maybe that's why I embraced a career where I wouldn't have to be seen because being judged, not only by the color of my skin, but just my look being dark. I hated my skin growing up. I was comfortable being in a studio and not having to be seen, right? So step two, and by the way, Tanya, if your response to Emmy's question was a multiple choice girl, all of the above, I'm, I'm, <laughs> too, I'm choosing E, A, B, C, D, and E, right? Let me, let me put an addendum to that. Mm -hmm. Just imagine for a second, being on the radio, knocking on all of the major markets, having insane success, working in New York and LA and Chicago and working with Isaac Hayes and having a show that came on after Steve Harvey and doing syndicated radio. Like I, I'm so blessed, but still after all of that, imagine for a second being extremely qualified to do a job, but people still doubt you because of the color of your skin. That's what it's like on the other side. So here we have a show where we, and we all have seen it, black, white, Asian, gay, straight, or indifferent, have seen the history of the Academy Awards. And finally, we got a black producer. We're opening up with Beyonce and she is blackity black. She's got 50 black women behind her, young girls with braids, with beads, on a tennis court in Compton with her daughter. And after she gives this phenomenal, breathtaking performance, and then we get into the show and we see Regina Hall and we see Wanda Sykes. And then throughout the show, we see D-Nice, who is a rapper from the Bronx mm -hmm. up in the rafters. We see Jill Scott, we see her, we see, you get the point. Mm -hmm. See, from my perspective, when I heard that Will Packer got that job six months ago, I was celebrating right then. And I was also grinding, hitting the pavement, trying to get in. Because maybe if I could introduce myself to Will Packer, he's not going to be judgmental. He's going to look at me for my ability and my talent. And because he's black, maybe he'll just give me a chance without me having to give a kidney. And I have had almost had to give a kidney elsewhere. You feel me? Mm -hmm. I'm almost done. Guys, we're on a global stage. This goes way beyond your living rooms, ladies and gentlemen. We are on a global stage and black excellence is on display. And because one man didn't like what another man said, he physically assaulted him in front of the world. And that's what it was to me. It was so much bigger. It was so much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. On the same stage where we were just yelling and screaming, Oscar so white. Mm -hmm. We just finished jumping up and down about that. Make it make sense. Mm -hmm. And you know what, Keith? <laughs> you better preach. Get, go tell them why you mad. <laughs> Get it out. Hello? Anyway, okay. So that's right, Tanya. Hydrate yourself, okay? Yeah, I was like, mm. So listen, she's right. Hello. So Keith, listen. So Keith came in and she poured out her heart. Mm -hmm. All right. I amplified her post and I got a, a bit dragged and a bit applauded, which showed how mixed everyone's opinion 
are. First of all, thank you, Keisha, for your post because you actually gave me names to research. Because when you posted, I was like, girl, I'm looking, I can't find it. I wrote down stuff. Will Packer um, and his associate producer, Shayla Cohen, were given a historic opportunity to be the producers for the show. Mm -hmm. There was an all black production team, first time in Oscar history. Terrence J, co-host, was a co-host on the red carpet. Beyonce received her first Oscar nomination for the song Be Alive in King Richard. And of course she had the opening show that Keisha talked about. Regina Hall, Wanda Sykes were co-hosts up there with Amy Schumer. Okay, D Nice was the DJ. Uh, Questlove won best documentary for Summer of Soul. Adam Blacktone was the music director. Derek Hodge was a the conductor. There were two HBCU students that got to present awards. Janora McDuffie, a member of Delta Sigma Theta, was <laughs> she's one. That's right. Give it up. She's one of the only two black women to ever have that honor at the Academy Award. All right. Anjanae Ellis was nominated for Best Supporting Actress. And Ghetto Gastro were the co-collaborators for the post-show governor's ball along with wolfgang puck that is not a um exhaustive list by the way but i dug at a lot of those things keisha gave me the information so right so keisha came through and keisha gave some insight to the experience of you guys a black woman you heard it in her voice a black woman in the industry um she's not a black woman who hasn't done stuff She's been behind the scenes. Keisha and I spoke off, off camera. And there's more to it. She's not telling y'all everything. You know what I mean? She's not telling. Come on, Black folks. We, we here now. We're having a conversation amongst ourselves. She's not telling you guys everything she has had to endure. Trust me, you guys. It's more. Okay? You think we're in 2022? but they operating like we not in 2022. And I'm gonna let you extrapolate that out, okay? I'm not gonna tell you what, what some of the small things she shared with me, but I'm saying we from the outside think they're in 2022. <laughs> Keisha's in here trying to make it do. And they, they ain't talk, they ain't, they ain't operated like it's 2022. That's why I'm gonna put it there. Okay, so Keish, this- Can is, I just say one more thing? Go for it, go for it. Do not forget what you're about to say. When I, first started doing voiceover, I was consistently handed auditions for black roles. There's a lot more to me than that. This is the struggle and I'm behind a microphone. I'm voicing things and I'm still being pigeonholed. My very, very first gig that I've ever voiced in voiceover was I was playing the character of Gloria from Madagascar, which funny enough, I think was played by Jada Pinkett in the movie. Wow, look at there, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And my line was, they like to move it, move it. And I said the lines and it was like, no, can you just put a little bit more like ghetto into it? Can you like step your neck? When you say it, like, this is what I'm dealing with behind a mic when nobody even sees me. So again, the struggle is real. I don't want you to lose your train of thought. I just want people to understand my journey and how I understand the struggle. And so, yeah, go ahead. Go, go, go. <laughs> no, that's why I wanted you to talk because uh, you have an insight that none of us can have while we're flapping our lips on Al Gore's mm -hmm. internet. Okay, you have an insight. So I'm going to play devil's advocate because if I don't, the people who watch this um, and watch the replay going to roast me. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. The first question I have is, what do you say then to the people who scream re respectability politics, Keisha? Because one of the things that I continue to hear um, when I amplified your sentiments was... This sound like respectability politics. If you just, you know, if the way the slave, somebody posted this, if the way the slave gets to be better is to be more like the master, then just say so. And I was like, but we're here, we're talking about it. And what do you say to the people who have said that and the people who, the same group of people who seem to also say, why are we trying so hard to elevate ourselves in white spaces? Oh, 
Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I got to ask the question. No, I, I, I understand. And I'm actually, I'm letting that marinate. Well, it's really not the point. The point is that the Academy Awards is a space where people's accomplishments are being recognized. And we all know that Hollywood isn't owned by us, but the, the, but the platform was projected globally. And I don't view it as you just trying to suck up to them white people. Like that's not, that is not how I view it. And I would dare anyone who would have that type of view to expand on that. And you will quickly learn that that is a misrepresentation of what the Academy Awards, like again, it's a, it, 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 it is an opportunity for everyone. It should be where everyone should be recognized for their accomplishments. You understand what I'm saying? And traditionally and historically, we have been ignored. Mm -hmm. We've been ignored. Now I could easily be a black girl voiceover artist who only does urban spots who only voices urban things, but I'm more than that. And my responsibility with my gift is to be an inspiration to those little girls who have been told that they cannot do something because of the color of their skin. I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to prove something to myself. Well, not only to myself, but I do want to inspire, encourage, and enlighten people that when you are being told you cannot do something, when you know you are qualified, when you know how you have all of the certifications and all of the degrees, for me, of course, it's experience. But how many times have you been told you cannot do something when you know you could? Why not be acknowledged on a global stage? To me, that's just what it is. And I'm not necessarily sure if I effectively communicate it, how I really feel. But it's just, it's hard for me to think that way. I, I, I don't, I don't. It, it. It's a, listen, it's a, I told you this week, my brain got stretched because I was enlightened to groups of thought that I do not share. I still don't share them, but I sat and listened to them. And that was a recurring uh, comment or theme under your specific post that it, it reeked of respectability politics and you know it's to just, home. You know, like kiss up to the white man basically i kid you not and i was just like huh well let me ask you something did they did did they did they if 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 that was the general consensus then, then not was, everyone but it was there well all of these people who were being included they didn't say i don't want to be a part of the show because it's the white man show okay which These... brings me to my point i'm glad you brought that's a wonderful transition let's talk about this um another thing and tanya feel free to jump in on this as well another thing that kept coming up in the conversations i was having is this concept we are not a monolith okay i got a lot of people saying to me rushni that the reason why um, the accomplishments, all the accomplishments of Black artists, performers, professionals, et cetera, were overshadowed during the Academy Awards is because people like me kept talking about the slap and not amplifying the other things, which I, I, I kind of disregarded because that's what I was trying to do. And I got a lot of, we are not a monolith. We are not a monolith. If we would stop operating like we're a monolith, if we would stop operating like one black person's um, behaviors reflect on us all, that would be better. Now, here's my thought. I put this on the screen because it's a concept that I think goes into this and I want to hear what you guys think about this. I'll ask Tanya. Fictive kinship is basically the anthropological concept of, of we are not a monolith, right? Mm -hmm. It's a term that they use to describe forms of social ties, you guys, that are not blood and not marriage. So here's a good point. The reason why I know Tanya is because she's a black woman with natural hair. I know her because of a fictive kinship that became a, a friendship in real life, right? But I met her because she was black and she had natural hair. We were both talking about blackness and natural hair on the internet. We met each other. The reason why I know Keisha is because of a fictive kinship, right? 
I met her because she was black and she was interested in people getting married, black women getting married. I was a black woman getting married, okay? And I swooped right in. I was part of her community. I've known her ever since. I am fascinated and I want to hear what you guys think about this concept of we are not a monolith because, because me, myself, Rushdie personally, I find that, how do I say this? Clearly it's utopic for us to want to be judged as not a monolith. I get the concept mm -hmm. of the utopia of all of us being able to be individuals judged specifically only on our individual thing. However, there are benefits to the kinships. And when the benefits exist, like Keisha pointed out, we go happily in that direction. There were people telling me we are not a monolith that had Katanji in their avatar. Right. So I would love to talk about this. You don't know her. She's right. only celebrating her. Cause she's, Cause she's a black girl. Cause she 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 a black girl. Right? Hello. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? No, you're so not. not you're all. telling me that we are not a monolith, but, right. but we benefit from the monolith. Now, I get it. Black people also are seemingly disproportionately affected by fictive kinship. Right? We have a lot of that happen to us too. One black person do it now is all of us. But go ahead, speak, Tanya. I'm curious. Yes. So I work with an anti-racism organization, a racial reconciliation organization called Build a Bridge. Um, build a Bridge. <laughs> Be the bridge to racial unity. Be the bridge where we build bridges. We are people who are, um, and I'm giving this shout out because this concept of not, not a monolith is a piece of what we talk about. We want to be bridge builders, right? To build relationships, to, to build bridges across racial divides. One of the things that we have to recognize is that while we are not a monolith, we are interacted with as a monolith and non-white communities tend to be engaged with um, in that way more, more than white ones by, uh, by the white world around us. You know, I don't want people getting upset, but I am gonna talk about black, white, whiteness. And so in America, whiteness kind of engages with non-white groups as monoliths. Um, and when you are in the majority group, majority culture, you have the privilege to do that. So we have pushed back against that because we know that if somebody black acts up, we all going to get, we're all going to catch flack for that. That is not something new. We recognize it. We know, and we engage communally. And some of that is just cultural too. You're not going to act up in these streets and make my family look bad, right? I definitely heard that growing up. And what, you know, what came to my head was he out here on this stage showing his tail. And my mother laughed when I said that, but Black people know what I mean. Like that's um, something that is not untrue. Like we do have things that are that we perceive ourselves in certain ways as a collective, even though I didn't know Rashmi 20 years ago, but if I saw you on the street 20 years ago, I'd have been like, right, Black woman, I'm a Black woman, I see her, I give a nod. We see ourselves as a collective because we have walked as a community through oppressive realities. And so there's a collective um, recognition. There's a collective understanding of what our people have gone through, what has gotten us to where we are today. So yes, on the one hand, we are a group, right? We in engage with the world as a collective in that sense. But we also have our own ways of interacting and perceiving things and seeing life. And I, when I use that term, we're not a monolith, I'm using it in that sense. I don't agree with everything that every other black person thinks. I don't know if they like hip hop or rap or whatever, right? Because it's, it's, it's kind of a microaggression and insulting to assume that we all do, but that people do. When I moved from New York to Georgia, I certainly got, do all black people like fried chicken and watermelon? because I moved to a predominantly white space in Georgia. And, you know, I was kind of like, you know, if I knew all black people, I could tell you. Well, so those kinds of things, no, we're not a monolith. No one really, no community is a monolith. But the reality is that when you come from a group that has been marginalized or oppressed, you are going to have certain things that are part of the collective. And when you come from a more communal culture, there are things that are going to be kind of overarching realities and experiences. You're going to root for Black people. Like, um, what's my girl? Issa Rae. 
Yeah, you know, I'm rooting for everybody black, right? <laughs> you want we want to see black people succeed because we know how much we've been kept down. We know how much we've been opposed and oppressed. I'm listening to what Keisha is sharing. Being out there like, oh my goodness, that industry sounds just intense and difficult. And every success, she's feeling that like this is a success for all of us. Like that's work that they're doing. So when one of us who has influence and power and insight, and maybe I'm taking Keisha's statements, but I'm sitting here listening, thinking this person has like gone before, paved the road and has certain, and has certain privileges. I'm just going to say that because of their level of stardom. And when they behave a certain way, that just does impact. You mean well, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, specifically. Yeah, no, that's what I, yeah. I thought that too. I'm like, I think these actions impact all the other Black performers, actors, people who, who don't have his level of influence. That They get hit by that in a sense. Like, that's how it looks to me. That's what I'm hearing. They are the ones who now are also, yeah, it, it's, it's, he's going to pay a price for it, but we know that we get collectively perceived and engaged with, and it's already an uphill battle. So I can hear the frustration and what you, what you, you know, like, guys, I recently sat through the trauma of um, racism training mm -hmm. and one of the things that they pointed out was the temperature of the room. And they were talking about how our collective experience as brown people and black people specifically is you walk into a room and the first thing you do without even realizing you're doing it is you scan the room to see how many other black people are in there. And the reason why you do that is because you now can tell how much of your actual self you get to be. So true. And, and they were describing how traumatic that is to live in a world where that is your reality. Imagine working in a closed world with a small number of opportunities, how this specific choice by will can affect the downstream when Keisha walks into a room now, you guys. That that's that's come on, Keisha. Am I getting it out? I'm trying to get it out with I'm saying imagine we're watching it from our TV and we're talking sometimes you got a nook, sometimes you got a book, which I'm gonna get to in a second. Um but when Keisha posted her post, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, we're not thinking about the small number of black people mm -hmm. who are coming into the white rooms basically because that i think that was part of your post that traumatized people i think you said in front of a bunch of executives or something like that well, and, like, oh, yeah. be and i'm just like that's not her point that's no. what hollywood is right and then not only that <laughs> not only that i understand something let me let me let me let me move up a little bit so you can hear what i'm saying <laughs> The, these people who are saying that we're not a monolith, right, are probably the same group of people that are saying representation matters, mm. right? Mm. <laughs> so if representation matters, why can't you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That was an opportunity for us to be represented, to show the world that we are not a monolith that we are actors, that we are voice actors, because Janora made history also, that we are directors, that we are musical geniuses. That... Mm -hmm. How can you not understand? And because the next day, that could have been the story. Mm -hmm. But again, right. you're not making sense. The math ain't mathing. <laughs> if we're not a monolith, then it's important to seize opportunities where we can be represented and show people, not, not even just these little group of people. If you have an opportunity to show the world that we are not a monolith, then why don't you understand that this is what we're talking about and for mm -hmm. this black man, not only to just assault another black man, but because he ain't like what he's saying. It doesn't make sense. And my anger and my frustration and what you hear is passion. 
I'm, I, I, I apologize. You don't have to explain to no, us. You understand. Okay. There's something in you. Just, listen, just like the people who you have a right. silence is the answer and we don't understand what they're talking about. We cannot understand. We have to trust that you have the experience and you know what you're coming at us with. No, you know, exactly. you're going, and, and, I, and I don't mean to jump all or all over the place. Go for it. You guys only knew what I wanted to. You do not understand what I went through. Can I just tell you a story quickly? Go for it. Seconds. Go for it. I have a friend who knows Will Packard. Well, I thought he was a friend. Personally, and he brought him to North Carolina two weeks after the announcement, announcement was made. I went through hell and high water because I thought he was going to bring me to my house. I put up a tent. I put carpet in the backyard. I put plants. I ordered tr uh, shrimp and grits and chicken. I had a full bar. I thought he was coming. I just wanted, I wanted to make him comfortable. I had an opportunity to say, it is so good to meet you. Listen to my tape. You know what I mean? And again, even just to do that, I thought that that would be easier because again, my train of thought was if I could somehow be considered as a voiceover artist for the Academy Awards, maybe I can inspire that little girl that's coming up beside me who says that you could never announce at the Academy Awards because it's white people that own it and you'll never get an opportunity. You're not even gonna listen to you. I wanted to inspire somebody. And for six months, I flew back and forth to Atlanta just to be in the room with him. Obviously, I didn't make it, but I did contact the producers. I got their attention. But this, this space is competitive. But when I found out that I didn't get the job, I was so happy to found, find out that Janora got it. Because I can still accomplish that, the, the goal of telling this young little black girl that you too can be a voiceover announcer. Because look at Janora. If you can see it, you can be it. Representation is so, so important. And mm -hmm. sometimes people just have to see us, be acknowledged, and to be adorned with a, an Academy Award. To you, it may be or ornamental, but that's a big deal. So you cannot yell and scream talking about, you know, that we're not a monolith and then not understand how important representation was that night. You can't do it. It don't make sense. That's a great point. That's a great point. All right. I'm going to move to thank you, Keisha. No. Um, the most disrespected woman in America is the Black woman. The most unprotected person in America is the Black woman. The most neglected person in America is the Black woman, Malcolm X. Um, this week, I was introduced to a deep root of pain that I do not share within my community. Me, Rushni Glamazzini, two decades of advocating for black women and their hair, a foundational part of the natural hair community on the internet, did not understand the implication of Chris Rock's joke when he said it, in that way, it I, I mean, we having a real conversation, y'all. When I heard the joke, it did not cross my mind. It didn't cross my mind. In conversations I have since had um, with my community, where I started out thinking, I mean, we're all on the same page, right? I mean, the man was doing his job. He told a joke at work with about the people in the audience, which is what happens in this specific context. Somebody jumped up on the stage and hit him. We're all on the same page, right? Uh, we were not on the same <laughs> page. I and if you guys have had conversations this week, we were not on the same page, all right? So um, what I started to hear a lot of was, and I wrote it down because I want to um, make sure I'm saying this correctly. I saw people, Tanya actually shared this and I reshared it. It's a uh, post from Fidgets and Fries on Facebook. It was a multi-level post basically about that person's feelings as well as why she doesn't want to have this conversation with white people. She was like, uh, God bless y'all on your journey. Her number seven thing true was, uh, her number seven point was the joke was in poor taste and it was offensive AF. One can be proud of a black man for standing up for his wife 
and upset at the way he went about doing so. I also had people all the way on the other side of the, the gamut, you guys. I had violence is the answer people. I had F around and find out. Sometimes you get slapped in the mouth. Like, and that was, and I'm not gonna lie to you guys, is still difficult for me to comprehend. Although I allow it, I know it's valid because too many voices are speaking on it. So the first thing I want to do is I wanted to bring that in because if I don't, they're going to be like, you didn't have the whole conversation. I put it out there. I understand that this exists. Can you guys, either one of you guys, can you guys speak to that concept of, I think the first person I actually heard say it was Tiffany Haddish. When they were interviewing after the event, she expressed it was wonderful to see a black man protect his wife. And I have since seen a lot of women share that a similar sentiment or a version of that sentiment. I have so many thoughts about this, but can, can either of you guys weigh in on that concept? You want to go first, Keisha? Let me go first. You know, I got to get stuff out. I forget. <laughs> You know what's so incredibly painful for me for that? And again, I have shifted my frustrations from Will and Chris to the group of people who are saying this. And the group of people who are saying that literally come from a community where the root cause of our people being in jail and in the grave is because of violence. Mm. We literally are fabric. We, we come from the fabric of a community where feelings of pride, of being disrespected, or the need to check somebody is the reason why we are in jail or in the grave. If, if I was an outsider looking in and I'm just flailing all these random you know, uh, sentiments about things that I didn't know about. Well, yeah, that, that's weird. But we come from a community where our young men and women are literally thrown in jail and do bids for senseless acts of violence. So it doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand how we can't. And again, we, we live in a society where for the past three, four years, we have seen violence intensified because of social media and cameras and you know what I mean? Like we're literally seeing these things play out on our computers and on our phones every single day. So to see that, to see black people literally losing their lives because of violence, because of, again, it's a sense of pride that you ain't gonna talk to me any kind of way, yo. It blows my mind that they would think that that would be okay to put your hands on somebody else because they didn't like what we don't live in that type of country. Maybe if we did, maybe if we lived in that type of society, it would be more acceptable, but we don't. When you were old enough to understand words, one of the first things your mama and your daddy or your granny told you was sticks and stones may break your bones, but words may never like we learned this ever since two two years old. So why is it, it, it it's, it's select, it's selective. It's, it's So weird. let me say this, Keish. I want to ask you this question because I honestly think this, okay, let me, let me see. This is not my thought. This is me channeling conversations I've heard from others. And I think you have a unique point of view. Um, so what I've heard from others is one, Jada has a, um, she has alopecia, right? And she has been vocal about that. So it's actually a medical a medical condition why her hair is not present, right? She cut it off because she was falling out and all that, and right? So she has alopecia. And two, because Black women feel so unprotected that Chris Rock, the sentiment I hear is he should have known better. Like he should have known that was not a joke to lob at Jada specifically because she's a black woman with a medical condition. Now, I'm not telling your business because it was in your bio. Keisha is a three-time cancer survivor. 
And I actually know, thought it was two. I didn't know that was the third time. I missed the third go around. Third girl. time was 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 thyroid cancer. They cut me right here near my hmm. vocal cords. Oh, okay. I got a story, girl. I'm telling you, it's a lifetime movie. So right. Nobody understands. Like I, as a matter of fact, when I chronicled my cancer journey, I called it kinky cancer. Even though I was dealing with bleeding out and, and having stomach pain and having a hysterectomy and having to take uh, shots for blood clots and literally losing the activity of my limbs, I called my, my journey kinky cancer because kinky is the act of being twisted in knots. Kinky mm -hmm. also describes the hair thing. My whole cancer, even though I've lost a lot of, and I have brain issues, even to this very day, cognitive issues. I reduce that all down to losing my hair. That's how much my hair means to me. Mm. So nobody knows bigger than me, but I'll just say this and I'm gonna let Tanya speak. You can call me what you want. That doesn't mean I can pull out a knife and stab you or hit you in your face. And that's really, we can overanalyze. And when I say we, I don't mean you and her, you know, us. I mean, we as a community, and I'm including everybody, white people included, can talk about all of the different layers and the elements and we can peel it back like an onion. But at the end of the day, this is about one man assaulting another man because he ain't like what he said, period. So thank you, Hisha. So um, I, <laughs> mm. so there was a lot there. So my thoughts, um, well, actually, before I go on, Rusty, can you distill the question that you asked one more time? Um, I was asking about what you think about the slap being not even encouraged, celebrated almost. Yes. Because it was, as I've heard so many say, nice to see a black man protecting a black woman. Give me your thoughts on mm -hmm. that. So I think <laughs> that we have to acknowledge that violence isn't okay. Ever. Ever. We might want to say, well, at least he had her back. But we know we've all been taught how, what is the appropriate and what is the inappropriate way to handle situations, right? On the global stage or in the, in the front yard, right? When people were fighting on my block in Brooklyn, that wasn't because that was how it was supposed to go down. Like that would have been the best plan of action. I have friends who ended up dead, dead. It didn't have to go like that, but violence was chosen. So I don't, I think that we're we're mixing up a whole lot of things, not us right now, but this conversation and this, this advocating for violence is mixing up a whole lot of things. It's pain, it's history and saying, well, sometimes you just gotta, you know, because I'm hurt. We learned when we were younger, that's not how we need to handle situations that are problematic. Now, I will say that that, that rhyme we learned, um, Keisha, I have had to dismantle that <laughs> because that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will also absolutely pierce my soul. They have power. I believe words have power. And I believe that because words have power, we need to address the words. Dress addressing the words doesn't mean you slap somebody. That actually is escalating the situation. That's not um, resolving, unpacking, fixing, or helping the situation. These are two grown men. They're in their 50s. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think that Chris's joke was tasteless and inappropriate. I think that we and need poorly to written. Uh, and poorly uh, written. Sorry, I got to throw that out there. Yeah, it was bad. It was poorly <laughs> written. We're in 2022. We need to get beyond making jokes about people's appearance and bodies and in order to get a laugh. Like Lizzo is constantly being maligned because she's overweight in people's minds. Like dark skinned people, you know. Like I grew up the brunt of of so many jokes because I was dark skinned. Those sticks and stones, those were not sticks and stones, but they hurt me. They put me in a box for decades. You know what I mean? But but back then the jokes were about black, black, black. You're a black African monkey, like stuff like that. Insulting, why is African used to insult people? So much stuff that we say about someone and it has to do with this exterior physical appearance. We need to move past 
joking like that and justifying it because all over the internet this week I saw, well, that's his job and a joke is a joke and people need to get over it. If you sit by a comedian, you're going to get teased. And I'm like, but why? There is such a, there is a way to be humorous in such a like really not just tasteful, but, but incredibly um, um, elegant way. Like there are jokes that are just, mwah, and they don't, they don't, somebody doesn't come away hurt. You shouldn't have to sit there and kind of be like, mm. now, yeah, we learn to laugh at ourselves. There's that. And I, I get that. Right. But, but I think we use the excuse of, it was just a joke to, to say things that are hurtful. And therapists will tell you when one partner is saying, well, I was just joking. They just too sensitive. The therapist is like, no, that's not okay. That's not just a joke. Those things matter. And justifying that because this person was at work, and I'm not saying you all justified that, but I heard this online, that's not okay. At the same time, hitting someone because you don't like what they said, because they hurt your wife, that's also not okay. That's not how we resolve this. What if these two men had, what if Will had gone up there and been like, listen, that wasn't all right. You know, what if he had said something? I, Chris Rock was expecting words. <laughs> You could tell because of the way he leaned in and was he was engaged, like, yeah, what you gonna say, man? You know, he thought it was something that he had the he got the joke and it was funny. What if they had talked? What if he had waited until after the fact and then they were able to come out later? There were so many other ways that that could have been a moment that that Will Smith used to address that, or Jada, you know, to address that. Look, that's not okay. Let's stop doing this. So but hitting um, somebody completely yeah. took the power definitely, of that. Definitely. I and, and on the on the flip side of that, and I, I promised myself that before I logged on tonight, that I would be totally honest and I would hold nothing back. Tanya, I respect what your opinion is. But for me, let me tell you, my train of thought was, mm -hmm. and again, the most sensitive, you ain't gonna be more sensitive about here than me. This is this <laughs> yeah, is kinky you. cancer you're talking to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Really hurt. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um to me, um, when he said that joke, just being honest, I didn't get offended at all. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you why. Because I don't remember the movie, number one, but I do remember the visual. I'm a very visual person. When I think of G.I. Jane, it's just my opinion, I think of Militant. I remember the action figure. I don't remember the movie, but I mm -hmm. remember Militant. I remember Tough. I, I, I don't know. And again, because of how he laid the joke, I love you, Jada. But when is, you know, when is the movie coming out or something like that? I, I, I didn't think, I, I didn't get offended right away. But I tried to be very, very, very careful with regards to telling people how they should, re, uh, uh, how they should, um, whether they should be offended or not. Because what's offensive to me, like I literally launched a whole black love movement in 2003. And white mm -hmm. people found it extremely offensive. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. again, how do you take a concept of love and saying, you know what? When I Googled African-American bride and couldn't find any images of myself, I'll just create my own. How mm -hmm. do you take that concept of love? And then on top of that, take that layer off and, and then create that virtual space and pull in other African-American brides and not, uh, this is before social media, not allow any Bull crap on my website, constantly regurgitating the, the, the whole theme of love and positivity and women do get along and we do get married and we do have babies and we, we're strong. How do you take something so positive and take it to the not.com and say, can we have a little piece of your world and, and, and dedicate it to black people and for them to say, well, we're not calling ourselves whitechocolate.com. You understand what I'm saying? So I don't tell people how to respond. And mm -hmm. I certainly don't tell people what they can or cannot say because this is America, right? Be freedom of speech, right? I mean, you can't say fire in a crowded theater, but you get what I'm saying, right? So I try not to do that because I didn't get offended. You did. I don't even, I don't even know if Jada got offended. She might just, may not even found it funny. Mm -hmm. But again, mm -hmm. I can't absorb all of that and analyze all of that because to me it really boils down to showing Serena's little daughter remember mm -hmm. now Will Smith played Serena's daughter's yeah uh, grandson 
Yeah. It also showed Blue Ivy, who was definitely in the building somewhere. And it also showed little black girls and black boys who were watching that program with their black families because somebody black mama said, look at all of this wonderful excellence. It, sh it, it showed them that it's okay to hit somebody when you don't like what they say. Mm -hmm. we and that's we not okay. Right. Well, well what it's I'm not saying okay. is, well, right. absolutely. But again, that's mm -hmm. what we're saying by defending the right. Lines. Exactly. So what do you guys and think about this comment? Say, can I say one thing? Go ahead, Go ahead. I, I also was not offended. When I first saw it, I was like, I mean, I actually didn't see it because I wasn't watching. Something streamed on Facebook and I was like, wait, what just happened? And I looked. And when I, when I heard the joke, I, I didn't realize that that was the joke at first. And I was like, oh, is, is there a new G.I. Jane? Is Jada going to be G.I. Jane again? That's what I thought at first. And then I was like, I saw her go. And I thought, oh, she didn't like that. Okay. But a moment later, I shared it with a friend and she shared a deep lament and grief because her, her young niece has cancer. And, um, and I thought, oh, I see how this is hurtful. I can see how this hurts people. And then I listened and I thought, you know, this is an issue for us. And I started listening to people's conversations and seeing, you know, we talk about hair. Hair is important for Black folks. Chris Rock made a movie about our hair. Like, I kind of feel like you know how important hair is to us. And I saw that a lot of people were offended. I just wanted to clarify because I, I wasn't offended. I was shocked with the slap. But I also was like, come on, you you know, this is, I think you called it low-hanging fruit, right? Like, um, Rashni, this isn't, like, why we had to joke yeah, about- I, it's, I said that to Tanya last night. I was like- Well, we're I'm always, gonna... our hair gets picked at so much. What? Please don't do this to us. Do you need to get busted in the face on stage because of it? And I think that that's what some people are. Okay, so Kai has a, has a great comment. People are so deprived of protection that they appreciate the action, even if they can acknowledge that it wasn't done appropriately. There's two versions of that. There are people who are literally like, I, I'm quoting someone. Sometimes violence is the answer. That is a quote from someone that I was talking to this week, okay? And then there are people in that nuanced in-between tie that you're talking about. Um, and I think for me, uh, by the way, we're coming to the end. You guys, if you want to hang out longer, please let me know. But I, I always want to um, honor people's time. I think for me, what I learned from this conversation is there is a deep root, like I said, of pain and trauma that I just do not understand. I can only come alongside and listen and acknowledge it exists. I cannot, I cannot understand how you get to celebrating this lap. I don't know how you get over there. I also realize that maybe I have not felt the unprotected feeling as much as some other people have, because culturally I'm from the Virgin Islands. I'm married. I got a man here at the house. I had a daddy. He was great. You know, like all the things that can make my community was great. Like I, really have to stretch myself because I was like, so many people are saying this. There was a YouTuber who specifically made that point. She said, I'm unpartnered. I have been dragged over the coals my entire life for my complexion and my hair. And my father is the only man on the planet that will protect me. When he dies, I am unprotected. And she said, I didn't like that Will did it, but when it happened, I did kind of feel a little tinge of like, mm, that's what you get. And I, I found that difficult to really empathize with. I did. And what I'm realizing, you guys, for me, is I probably have less of a root in that space. But so many women are explaining that they, like Kai said, this deprivation uh, you know, the black woman is the most disrespected. Now, I was mad too, Keish, because like I said, I was so happy that you posted your comment because it gave me names to search. I was like, y'all, I feel like other things happened. They said it was an all, it was like an all black production team. I woke up, I went to sleep the night before you guys. I was tired. I'm old. You know what I'm saying? I had to go to bed early. I didn't watch nothing. I woke up the next morning. I was ready. I was like, okay, I'm going to see these articles. We about to see it. 
couldn't find it. You know, somebody was like, it's not overshadowed, Rushni. It's overshadowed because it's all you're talking about. Well, it's overshadowed because I can't find the information. But right. see, that's because it starts and ends with them. It starts, it begins and ends there for them. What about me? Hmm. What about what about what about me who needs to try to go get a, a, a job um at, hmm. at, at an award show next year? Like what 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 about me? How how do I unsee that for for that five-year-old that saw that? Hmm. Like that that's why I, I'm so unbelievably sad because people can't see past their own circumstance. I mm. think if people were just to open their mind and understand that there are many, many sides to a situation, yeah. we may be able to get somewhere as a society, but because people are so closed-minded and they cannot see the forest for the trees, it's only what's right here, it just feels very restricting. It, it feels very depressing because I, I thrive off the, just the feeling of advancement, kind of, sort of, even if, it, even if it's performative, if, even if it just feels right. You know what I mean? But we'll mm. never get anywhere if people aren't willing to see that it's much bigger than that. Mm. It's much bigger than that for you. They're in, on Twitter telling Tiffany Cross, the beautiful woman who comes on MSNBC, uh, we're looking forward to your show this weekend, but do me a favor. Don't talk about the Oscars. Like, you can't tell me how to... How to oh, I had a bunch of people tell me that. Like, and I was like, please remove yourself from my platform. <laughs> right. Like, this is traumatic. Don't tell me how to process mm -hmm. my trauma. It's very dismissive. Mm -hmm. And it's invalidating. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Anyway. Do you think this will affect you as a voice... Come on, I, I want... Well, talk about it, Keith. Don't make a face. Say something. Yeah. <laughs> it, was <laughs> it was a rhetorical question. I wanted to share your face. <laughs> of course. I, I, again, and I, I was very strategic in letting you know what my journey has been with regards to the frustration of being put in a box. And what's so weird about that is I am a voice actor. Mm -hmm. You don't see me. You hear me on television commercials when I was on radio. Well, well, that's different because, you know, but yeah, like when you go to your, your meditation app and I'm the one that's saying, relax, breathe. <laughs> or when you call the hospital and if you would like to speak to your doctor, breathe. like I'm a voice. <laughs> and so to be honest with you, one, one time I, I got, I got a job that was in a primarily white space. And they literally discouraged me from telling people that I was black. Like I deal with racism and I'm not even seen. So of course it's already hard. And I'm not necessarily saying that the Oscars would have healed all of that. But uh, again, I just feel like the world may be able to get fixed one person at a time. I don't think that we could heal the entire world but again, when you are on a global stage, representation really, really does matter. You're talking to yeah. Chocolate Bride's founder. Yeah. I know the importance of representation. Yeah. So, yeah. Of, of and course. that statement, you said something, Keisha, earlier that, that reminded me, that statement that is um, about respectability politics, I really feel like that is getting way overused. Like now it's used whenever anything that somebody doesn't like getting told about. <laughs> <laughs> that might have something to do with how we carry ourselves or how we speak in a certain setting. You know, I've heard it. I've heard that thrown out a lot. And I'm kind of like, it's not respectability politics to say, like, behave yourself. <laughs> and I'm not trying to say it in an insulting way. But like, we don't advocate when, when kids come home and say, I had a fight. Like, that's not exciting news for a parent. I mean, generally, you know. We want them to behave differently. We don't want them to use violence. We don't want them to do those things. It's not respectability politics when suddenly it's because white people can see it too. Yes, that that is something that I do think um, we talk about because we're like, ah, oh, now here we go, right? Because right, that's right. we don't want to have to put up with all the foolishness now that's going to come from that because it does. Right. And that's just another piece of it. But that's not the whole thing. 
It's exactly. not all, we don't want the white folks to see us acting up. No, we don't want to act up. Right? <laughs> we want to actually right. do, like live well. And I think that for me, I feel like not, I'm not, well, for me, you know, I'm like, this person has a massive platform. They have a lot of influence and they have presented themselves in a certain way over the last several decades in this space. And so that looked very out of character, but it does, but for us, it doesn't, it don't take a whole lot of out of character to get you thrown into a pot of, see, yeah, that's how black folks are. Exactly. We are. Exactly. And that does matter. It's not, it's not so much that we're trying to impress the white people as we actually are working against stereotypes. We actually are, and we are working to be who we are, our best selves. He failed his best self and he acknowledged that, right? This was not my best self. I, it was wrong, violence is wrong. And I appreciate that, but he's not, he doesn't have the privilege, even as successful as he is, he doesn't have the privilege of people being like, we hear that, that's okay, yeah. You know, you made a mistake, no, you're black. I mean, that's still a piece of it. And his blackness, whether we like it or not, is going to reflect on um, black people. And it's not just black people thinking that because the people who get upset about respectability politics are mostly black, right? right that I've seen anyway. But they also know that's true. Like they also know when we, we'll get upset when we hear about these mass violent events that are horrible. What do we think? God, I hope the person wasn't black. I mean, we think that because we know how the news is going to engage with it, how the public is going to engage with it. We know what's going to happen. So not that the event isn't awful. It's still awful. But but when it's awful and then there's that layer put on, ugh, that's just that's just adding fuel to a fire that we don't want it added to. And as you can see, by the way, things are kind of going down. Yes, we've known him for decades. Yes, he's super successful. Yes, he's kind of like the, the the black guy next door, right? That we all love. But because he did this one thing and raged and screamed and cursed at this guy, now he's a horrible person. He's a brutalizer. He's a this, he's a that, he's a the other. And I'm like, is this the same Will Smith that we all watched in our teens and 20s and enjoyed as the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and liked his music if you're a little bit older like me, right? This isn't the face he's presented for decades, but now that's who he is in the Listen, eyes of the world. I won't say it because you won't say it. The white women turned on him. I'll say right. it. The comment turned on him. The white like, women. Every day I'd come in and it'd be seven to 12 white women talking about how much of a brutal animal he was. And I would just be like, why is this such a, right. a noticeable pattern right now? Are we talking about the same Will Smith that we I all... like Will Smith, y'all. <laughs> right. He did a stupid thing. I'm not going to justify what he did, but but this is why this is why this matters for black people because we know how you know remember when Beyonce when Beyonce did a uh get a formation <laughs> like the Super Bowl uh -huh, yeah. and people who you know she crosses she's she's cross cultural we all love her and then she came out with that and people were like Offended, how dare she? She's not for us anymore. And I'm like, just because she wants to support blackness doesn't mean she's anti-white. You know what I'm saying? Just because. So, so you can yeah. be black and do something and it not be somehow attached to all of the stereotypes that have to do with blackness when you do that dumb thing. Or whatever Prime the example. thing. Prime example. You see, the Oscars was a huge deal to me. Mm-hmm so big that I was going to get a hotel room and watch it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I was going to make it a big event because to me it was so history. Mm -hmm. And so I sat down in front and I'm, I'm done. And I sat down in front of my television. I had my phone in one hand. I had my laptop in the other. I'm ready to talk to my friends on my cell phone, my folks in the vo voiceover community, because we're all, we all listening to Janora, you know, and this was her first live and out. So I'm ready to do that. And then I have my laptop. I'm on Twitter and this was the, I saved it. This is the very, very first tweet that I saw regarding the Oscars coming from a man by the name of Cedric Scott Wood. He wrote hashtag Oscars just minutes into the Oscars and it's 90% about blacks. The music was 90% black oriented. 66% of the hosts are black. Off color and on color jokes abound. Organist is black. 
Why is this? So take that with take actual tweet. Take that <laughs> how you will, and then try to understand why I'm all in my feelings. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. what you just said, Tanya. Exactly. I I I hear you, girl. I do. Yeah. Oh, so first of all, I hope the hour is far spent. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I hope. As I said at the beginning of this, I'm not going to be able to cover everything in any depth. We aren't going to, and we didn't, but we did. I think we did an incredible job. Thank you, ladies. And we're not going to make everybody happy because when you are having complex conversations of depth that take critical thinking, people are going to have differing opinions. One of the things I have learned is you need to listen and to understand, not to agree. And your stance still gets to exist if somebody else doesn't agree with you. So I appreciate the three of you, or the two of you for being here um, to have this, you know, have different voices add to a difficult conversation. The other thing I want to say specifically to Keisha is I appreciate you so much for lending us an insight we would never see. Yeah. Because yeah. as a Black person, every single one, not all of us ain't going to be voiceover artists. We are not. <laughs> but all of us can acknowledge our different spaces that we mm -hmm. are trying to exist th and thrive in mm -hmm. and what that could look like. She's giving you, I'm, listen, I'm telling you, she's my friend. She has told me things in more detail. She's giving you what you can give. But come on, y'all. Like, it, <laughs> so, thank, right. I'm like, so I, I appreciate you so much because when you posted, I was like, now here's a person that knows what's happening under the, under the lid. We out here shouting outside the box. Keisha inside the box. Like, this affects us. The, not mm -hmm. the big big wigs who y'all see all their names. Us in the background. So thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tanya, for being here, for lending your voice. I, I swung Tanya in at the last minute, you guys. So I just appreciate her so much. Um, Tanya, you. can you let people know where they can find you? Yes, I have two YouTube channels. One is called Black and Natural in Jerusalem. It's about my natural hair journey. And I used to live in Jerusalem, Israel. So that's why that's the name. And the other one is Front Yard Homestead, Backyard Raised Bed. It's all about my family's homesteading journey in self-sufficiency. And I can also be found on Instagram at homestead underscore raised bed. That's all about our homesteading journey as well. Thank you, Tanya. Keisha, can you let people know where they can find you? I'm following you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me grab my phone right quick. I'm all <laughs> over the place. Uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, at Tisha Bunk, Instagram, Tisha Bunk. Uh, I even have a TikTok page, but I don't want y'all to follow me on TikTok because that's my space where I can kind of like be and not have to worry about anybody knowing mm -hmm. me. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there's power. <laughs> I'm, I'm a lover of voice, so I'm on all social media platforms. I got a LinkedIn page. I got a website. Just Google me. Um, and, you know, I, if I can just take any opportunity that's given to me, thank you, any, to just inspire, encourage, and enlighten folks. And if folks will just open their minds and be willing to communicate and not invalidate each other's opinions, mm -hmm. this would be a beautiful world. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks to Thank everyone you. for joining me on another episode of Find Your Light. And I will see you guys in the next video. Until the next video, be well, be encouraged. Here's a pineapple, you guys. Bye. Y'all hang around. Bye.